Uh, without further delay, I would like to introduce you uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. De Croix. He is Minister for Development Cooperation, Digital, of, uh, Environment, uh, Digital Agenda, of course, and Telco. And I would really like to thank you for supporting the Startup Manifesto and all your of efforts in open data. Mr. De Croix, thank you for being here. Good morning, and I would like to, uh, first of all, thank Bianca for... Uh, rearranging the schedule and, and um, making sure that my delay was not um, uh, jeopardizing the rest of the schedule of the day. Bianca, we could talk about mobility in Brussels, but actually I think the problems are not due to Brussels. This is just because there's a general strike and it's really hard to get on this side of the, uh, of the city. Um, uh, what I would like to talk to you uh, about today is, is of the role, the role of, of data in the economy of today. Um, I think if you look at uh, a few of the trends that are impacting um, the economy today, I think the first one obviously is, is, is the internet, but especially mobile internet, which is really something, uh, something disruptive. Second element is the internet, of, uh, the internet of things. And the third element, which is basically tying them together, is, is big data and the, the massive amounts of data that are, uh, that are generated. I think it's fair to say that uh, data will be the new coal or the new oil, or the, the, the new fuel of the, uh, of the, of the economy. Um, and the question is, how do we uh, transform our economy to take that into account? I think a lot of people today are convinced that data and mobile technology and so on will have an impact on certain industries. Um, what I like to say every time is that it will change all industries, and it will definitely change in a most dramatic way the industries that today think that there will be no impact at all. I think a lot of industries know that things are moving. Some of them, which I often would like to call the dull industries, which think, you know, we are kind of immune for the, uh, this, this uh, industrial revolution. Actually, I think it's in those dull industries that the impact will be the biggest. We have some work in Belgium to um, make sure that everything is aware of that. Uh, beginning of this year, I still talked to a person which was yeah, captain of industry, captain of a somewhat dull industry, that's true, but who told me, you know, this internet thing, it will go over. <laughs> Don't worry. In a few years, we will go back to normal. Um, I was a bit surprised and I said, you know, I'm not sure it actually will go over. Uh, it's going so fast that every year it will be different. But thinking that you will go back to business as normal, I do not think that will, uh, that will happen. By the way, this is one, one of the initiatives that we are taking with, with uh, Digital Belgium, is to do a tour throughout Belgium. It's called the Tournée uh, Digital. Um, it, it has some link to, to our um, love for Horeca and others. But it's, it's, the idea is to really um, bring our SME um, uh, people around the table. Um, I think a lot of our small business owners are seeing the impact of uh, of digital, they are seeing the impact of, of, of e-commerce. What I try to tell them is that today, it's still an opportunity. But if you wait two or three more years, it's not an opportunity, it'll be, it, it's a gigantic threat. And um, the threshold for any business to use Internet of Things, to use mobile and to use big data, the threshold has never been lower, never been lower than today. And I, I often try to bring local examples, people who have, who have used this. One, one, one example that I love to use is uh, someone who is a traiteur, and he, he, he cooks, and at some point he decided to make an app. And so he explained that the app cost him $2,000, uh, 2,000 euros, sorry, 2,000 euros, and he already has 500 downloads today. Um, and basically what people use it for is that at noon they decide, you know, I'm not sure I want to cook tonight, but maybe I can ask someone to, uh, to bring something. It's actually very, very straightforward. It's very, very easy. He has tried to calculate, but he says that his return on investment on those 2,000 euros is more than, a, more, than, uh, more than 800%. You know, the investments today to be active in the digital world are actually very, very, very uh, limited. And it means that, of course, the impact on data will be a gigantic, uh, a gigantic one. 
Maybe quickly go through the five pillars that we are uh, working on with Digital Belgium. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. You can go to the website digitalbelgium.be uh, where you can find all the, uh, all the details. What we try to do is to work somewhat in a startup fashion. Uh, we, we thought, you know, let's have a goal where we want to get. Let's make a light plan, but let's bring it to action. Uh, plans in the political world, we have a lot. Uh, plans into implementation, that is something else. So we wanted to emphasize the, the implementation with the idea that, you know, some priorities we would have put will be the, the right priorities, some priorities might be off, and we might pivot at some point if it's, uh, if it's necessary. One element, obviously, which is a key one uh, related to this audience, is uh, our open, open data uh, policy. Uh, our open data, uh, so the translation of the European Directive, will be gone, going to the Parliament in a few, uh, in a few weeks. Uh, up to now, we've had uh, a lot of very good feedback from the open data community, with whom we've worked very closely together to see uh, if we were doing something that really could make, uh, could make a difference. The estimation is that once we have it in laws, this will be one of the most forward-looking open data regulations that you have in the whole, uh, in the whole of Europe. And I think this is important. Up to now, governments have always thought that it is our data. And actually, it's not our data. I mean, the data we have on you, it's actually your data. Typically, what you could say is that what the public is giving to government, it's taxes, and in Belgium, you give a lot of taxes, it's taxes and it's data. Actually, that's the way you should be looking at it. You are providing us with means, with financial means to work, but you're also providing us with details on yourself. There is no monopoly for governments to do value added with that data. And that was the philosophy up to now. Up to now, government said, you know, this is our data, we are the government, so we are the only ones who can do useful things with that. I think that's the wrong perspective. I think the right perspective is to be much more uh, open-minded about it and to say, you know, we have the data, let's provide it to the private sector, let's provide it to hobbyists, and let them do things with it. I think in general, if you give people freedom, in general, they do good things with it. We might have to uh, correct it from time to time, but providing the data and saying, you know, if there is a useful thing to be done with that data, why not, why don't you go ahead I think it's, it's, it's a different mindset than we, that we need to have today than what we historically uh, had. Um, what we do uh, try to emphasize on is a few more technical elements, making sure that the data is in a format that could be uh, used in an industrial, uh, in industrial way, uh, making sure that there are feedback loops to make sure that when there are um, uh, mistakes in the data that they could be corrected from the outside and that it could be uh, brought back to, uh, to our data sets. Agoria has estimated that the upside potential of an open data policy would be around 900 million in, in Belgium, which I think is quite, uh, quite a good thing. That is one, uh, one element. Second element is uh, working on the economy. Now, working on the, on the economy, it's creating a framework. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be the ones creating the startups. I'm not going to be the ones that are changing the business models. I think that business models is the key element. Very often people think this is about technology, this is about uh, using the most, uh, the, 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 the latest stage economy that, uh, uh, technology that exists. I'm not sure. I think the whole reflection is much more about business models than that the reflection is about uh, technology. And there, governments have an other role to play than what they've done up to now. I think our role should be to keep the finger at the pulse. And keeping the finger at the pulse means that we swiftly change our legislation to make sure that things are possible. Government should be in a position to make things happen and to make sure that the legislation is open enough for that. Now, does that mean that we should just accept anything? Of course not. We all know the discussion uh, in the peer-to-peer -peer economy about some, well, if I say taxi service provider, this is already a discussion in itself, because is it taxi service or not? This is already part of the, uh, of the, of the discussion. But basically, there's two answers to that when there is a new business model that, that erupts. One answer 
is what I would call the French answer, which is basically put them in jail, and if you put them in jail, it will not happen. And the other solution is to say, you know, this is new, this is sexy, let's just, let's just make it happen without asking questions. That's not the right answer either. I think the right answer is in the middle. It's not because it's a new business model that you should not respect social regulation, or you should not uh, respect fiscal regulation. But maybe it's also an opportunity for us, when you see these types of economy coming, to adapt our fiscal and social regulation to make sure that certain things can be possible in our country. Let's make it clear. I am not here to help a big American startup. I'm, I'm not here to help them. But I'm here because there's a hundred Belgian startups who are trying to do approximately the same in the peer-to-peer -peer economy. And I want them to be able to start here in Belgium and not have to move to the UK or to the United States to, uh, to start their business. This is happening much more often than you think. People who have an idea, people who have talent, you know, if we can't make it happen in Belgium, we will go to some other place to make it, uh, uh, to make it uh, happen. So that's the role of government. I think the role of government is, yes, to make sure the rules are respected, but in a changing economy, to make sure that we change the rules also in, in, in a very swift, uh, uh, swift way. Yeah, there's a whole, a whole chapter on infrastructure, but I won't be talking too much about that because I, I, I think we're all con convinced that um, high-speed connectivity is, uh, is important. Um, and, and I really hope uh, that in Belgium we do everything to make sure that the high-speed networks can come here. High-speed networks on the fixed lines were actually quite good. High-speed networks on the mobile, um, mobile part, we are catching up. And I really hope that we're not making the types of mistakes that have been made in the past in certain parts of the, uh, of the country. A key element, I think, is skills, skills and jobs. And this is, a, this is a difficult one. When you think about skills and jobs, a lot of people will think about what's happening in our schools, in, in, in primary and secondary education. And I actually see a lot of great things happening. I mean, the STEM education, it's uh, taking off uh, everywhere. There is private initiatives like the Coder Dojos and the others, which are, I think are doing, uh, doing great things. And, and I'm not too worried about our, our education system. I think we have a rigorous and quite analytic education uh, system, and I think things are going in the right direction. One reflection we should have, though, is on what will be the jobs of the future. I know that some people say there will be no jobs for humans in 20 or 30 years. I think that's wrong. I, I, I do not believe a second of, uh, of that, and that is because human beings have always been incredibly creative to find ways of bringing value added. And I am sure we will bring value added. By the way, over the last hundred years, technology has not destroyed jobs. Technology has created jobs and has created more stable jobs than we've ever had in the, in the past. Still, the reflection that we need to have is in 20, 30 years, what will be the jobs that could remain? I don't have the answer to that, but I'm sure there's a lot of smart people, even in this room, even in this room, <laughs> that, did, that didn't really sound right. <laughs> also in this room, I mean, to think what could, be, what could be the jobs of the future in 20 or 30 years. And that I would like to see translated in our primary education. Because I have a kid of four year old, I have a kid of seven years old. Um, I would love that he gets some of those competencies now because he will be starting to work approximately in 20, uh, in, in 20 years. And, and if you think about it, there are certain things that people will always be better at than systems on their machines. That is obviously creativity and, and ideation, uh, finding solutions to things, but it's also everything which is the, the, the emotional relations. Everything that has to do with the, with the relation between human beings where there's a layer of emotions, human beings will always be better at that, at that than, than, uh, uh, than machines. If you took, take those three things, uh, creativity, ideation, and problem solving, and, and, and emotions, there is a skill there for everyone. Every child has talent in one of those three. And that's a key element. Because the, the biggest mistake we could make is that the new economy would become an economy where only the Einsteins could have jobs. That would be the biggest mistake we can make, 
because you would create a dichotomy in your society where you basically say the smart ones, you will ha have value added jobs and the rest of you please be quiet and don't bother us. There is no reason that it should be going that way because in those three elements that I said, every child has talent in these. And that is, I think, what we should be doing in our ed education today, is making sure that we take the best out of every child and making sure when we say the best, that it is the elements that we think will be important in, uh, in, in 20 years. The biggest challenge, I think, is with the current uh, working population. Current working population, uh, the estimation is that approximately 60% of the workforce has basic uh, digital skills. By 2020, 90% um, of the jobs will require some element of digital skills. We will not require 90% of people to be IT engineers, but we want them to know a basic element of, uh, of, uh, of digital. And this is, this is a challenge. And, and this is why, together with Saskia van Uflen, we created uh, the, uh, coalition, the Grand Coalition for digital, uh, digital Skills, is to make sure that we use any means that are uh, available in the next five years to make sure that everyone gets the basic skills of digital. And we count on the private sector, we count on the uh, civil society, we count on, on um, uh, governments to do it, on local governments to do it. We should find any means to make sure that we can expose people to the basics of the digital, uh, the digital world. It is actually not that complicated, but some people are just afraid of it. And they're afraid of it for the wrong reason, because they still think that it looks like MS-DOS in the 80s, and that indeed was scary, but today it's not at all the case. And, and so making sure that that 30% of the population gets the basic elements of skills, I think is a big, uh, is a big challenge. Last element, and especially related to, uh, to data, is, is, is security and is, uh, and is privacy. Um, this is a delicate balance. I think a lot of people understand the value of open data. A lot of people understand uh, the benefits that they could get from making their data available. But I believe that in the medium term, the notion of privacy will be something in intimately individual. It will be a choice that every person makes. Some, person will be fine, some persons will be fine with providing a lot of data. Some will actually be, be very reluctant in, uh, in, in, in doing that. Today, a lot of our privacy regulation is completely ununderstandable. Uh, even, I think, often for professionals, let be that it would be understandable for uh, a, regular, uh, a, a regular citizen. There, I think, on the European level, we are today completely spread out. There's 28 different instances that are working with that. I obviously plead for having a central instance that is, that is doing that and for pushing it in, in that direction. Push it in the direction where people can make their own choices, but let's make sure that there is also instances that can do an audit. And yes, I can provide certain data. I think that's fine. The whole question is, what do you do with it? There's a lot of great things that can be done with data, but there is also discrimination that can be, be done with data. There's also a lot of not productive things that can be done with data. And I think that the European authority should have the means to intervene and to just audit what the procedures are that are being done. I think if it's a neutral instance that is doing this, I think this is perfectly, uh, perfectly fine. Technology, and I will conclude with that, has been one of the strongest drivers of freedom in the world over the last decades. There's nothing else that has brought so much freedom to people. And when I say freedom, you would say yes, political freedom, the possibility to express themselves, the pro possibility to make informed choices, yes, definitely. But much more than that. I think technology, has over the last decades, it has brought transparency, it has helped to fight corruption, it has lowered the barriers for people to participate in society. Participate in society just based on knowledge, but also lowered the barriers for being, being an entrepreneur. It has never been easier worldwide to be an entrepreneur than, than, it, than it is today. The peer-to-peer -peer economy, for which some people are afraid, the peer-to-peer -peer economy in the United States has brought a whole public into entrepreneurship that 10 years ago would never have thought that they actually could be an entrepreneur. So I think technology is not something that we should be afraid of. It is really something that has liberated more people than ever before. But there's a dark side, and we should not close our eyes for that dark side. 
And that dark side is the use of technology to do just the opposite. You know, censorship has always happened. And censorship obviously is a bad thing. And censorship was actually quite easy before. You can just silence a few journalists and it works. The new censorship is something different. The new censorship is basically plugging out social networks, uh, plugging out uh, mobile communication networks. It's happening throughout the world. It's happening in places that are actually not that far away. This is a much more intrusive way of, of censorship because it means that you can actually not just shut up journalists, you can just shut up the, the, the occasional conversation between, uh, between people. That is something we should not accept. Equally so for mass surveillance. We've always had historically reasons to listen to certain people when we think they are suspects. And I think that's perfectly fine. If I believe that you're a suspect, I think we can defend that there's a reason to listen to your private conversations. But mass surveillance is something else. Mass surveillance is continuously listening to everyone. What does that mean? You're basically saying that everyone is a suspect. That is completely against anything that we have fought for in the last decades. In the last decades, we have fought for civil liberties. We have fought for the right to be able to think and to talk about the ideas that we think are important. If we are listening to everyone on a continuous basis, I think this is uh, uh, rectangularly against to what we've always, um, always played for in the, last, uh, in the last decade. So I think we should have a discussion on that. And we should have a discussion between states, and I would hope that at some point at the United Nations level, there will be a discussion on how we use these kind of tools. Some of these tools are great, but I fear that the way they are used today, they are used in a very uh, intrusive way, and in a way I think that has the potential to destroy more than what we are, uh, uh, we are building up. I hope that you understood that I'm an optimist, that I'm optimistic about, uh, about technology, and that you have governments, and, and uh, Bianca, I think I heard the same from you, you have governments in Belgium who are embracing the opportunity. We have in Brussels a gigantic opportunity. We are the center of Europe. We have highly educated people. We speak a lot of languages. We have a lot of purchasing power in, uh, in Brussels. And maybe the last element, we are not the most difficult people in the world. We Belgians are actually, are actually quite easy people, and we find our way. And we find our way in an international scene, which I think is much more important than, uh, than ever. So um, what I would uh, want to, f to finalize with is that we can create a framework. And I think the framework we make should be a good one. If you think there are certain flaws, please let us know. I mean, we will listen to you, and we will try to, uh, to adapt. But what we do is just make the framework. It's a framework to make something great, but if we make something great, it's you that are going to do it. Thank you. So first, uh, this is one question that obviously I did not answer, is on uh, uh, what we do for investments in, um, in startups. Do you, who of you know the tax shelter system? So is that the film tax shelter system? Or the yeah. <laughs> so the, the movies tax shelter system, you know, we have created since July of this year another system which we also called uh, tax shelter, which is basically a scheme to um, stimulate investments in uh, in startups. It's very comparable to what exists in the in the UK uh, has existed over the last years. What's the idea? Let's say that I want to invest in your startup, and that I invest 100,000 euros in that startup. If I invest 100,000 euros in that startup, I will get a tax deduction on my personal income tax of 45% of that amount. So this is actually quite big, uh, quite big stimulus. 45% is for micro enterprises, which is typically when you start. When it's an SME, the deduction is 30%, uh, which is still quite nice. It applies during the first four years of, um, uh, it, you have to do the investment during the first four years of that, uh, of that company. The maximum investment is 250,000 uh, euros with a maximum of 100,000 uh, every year. This is typically the investment scheme for friends, fools, and families. Yeah? It's, it's, it's just giving the means to start. I know that there is another domain which you should work on, which is the scale-up capital. And I know that in Belgium it's difficult to find scale-up uh, capital. 
We are looking with the sector if there are certain things we can do to, uh, uh, to help. Um, what I think is key is that if you take these kind of measures, is that you do not choose industries. So the tax shelter system, it applies for everything. I mean, I hope, I hope some of you will use it for some data science uh, startup, but if you want to use it to, to start a bakery or a plumber, it's perfectly fine. I mean, I, th I don't think as governments you should be choosing which industry is the good one, which industry is a bad one. Anyone who wants to start a business, I actually think it's a good thing. And so we help to provide you with the basic means for, uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you very much.